Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with retired Marine turned bladesmith, Jonathan Caruso of Leadlil Knives. Uh, Matt Chase of Hogtooth introduced me to Jonathan at Blade Show this year, where I got a chance to check out a few of his really skillfully forged and finished fixed blade knives. One of them was his EDC. Uh, after a while, I commented on how familiar he seemed, and as it turns out, he was because I saw him on TV. Uh, Jonathan was on Forged in Fire. He was the champion season six, episode 24 of a memorable and torture-tested boar sword. And I remember my uh, my wife and I watching that and enjoying that one in particular. Um, though he prides himself on making refined but useful tools, he showed off his raw talent when challenged with this complicated build. Uh, and I recently discovered that he forges some fine looking tomahawks. So we have a lot to talk about here. But first, if you want uh, to help support what we do here, if you think what we do here is valuable, you can help support the show on Patreon. Uh, quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Remember, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. So um, as I mentioned up front, uh, I met you uh, wandering around uh, with Matt of Hogtooth Knives looking for materials at Blade Show. Yes, that was my first uh, Blade Show, actually. So, yes, I was very overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, me too. And, and, and uh, you know, at least I didn't have to look for materials. You know, you and Matt were there looking. Uh, it's a great place to buy materials, right? Oh, absolutely. It's a, it, it's a knife maker's dream world. Uh, the, all the, the makers for one, and then all the material that you can buy the, from the steel to the handle material. It's, uh, it's an overload. It's a sensory overload for, for some. So yeah, it was, it was very exciting. It was, uh, really cool to, well, meet you, but also, um, you know, I met a couple other people there who would just, you know, you weren't showing, but you had knives to show and you yeah. pulled out a couple of those zipper packages uh, and showed me your EDC too, and I was really yeah. impressed with the with the forging. You know, uh, I don't talk to a lot of people who forge, and it's a it's um you know it's an impressive and different sort of skill. It is. It's a uh, it's very therapeutic. Uh, it's one of those things that I got into about seven seven years ago, and you know I didn't start out forging. I started out making. Uh, stock removal. And then I took a class through the ABS in uh, Western North Carolina with uh, my mentor, uh, Jim Kroll. And uh, it just took off from there. And just the the methodical hammering on steel and shaping it into something from a bar of steel into something useful, uh, something that, you know, is the everybody uses a knife every day, whether it's that it's in their pocket or it's in the kitchen. So it's one of those things that's very uh, rewarding to be able to make something like that that everybody can use. Yeah. Uh, you uh, you were in the Marine Corps. Thank you for your service. It's always uh, always an honor to speak with someone who willingly fought on my behalf and my family's. I appreciate it. Um, appreciate it. Before that, before the Marine Corps, were you into knives? Were you always a knife guy? Oh. How did this how did it happen that you became a, a knife maker always. for a living? I was always into knives. I don't even remember the first knife I had as far as what age I was, but I can always remember having a knife in my pocket. Even uh, when I went to school, I remember in elementary school, there was, I got in trouble because, uh, you know, I got a slap on the wrist, so to speak. Hey, you can't bring that to school. But uh, some kid needed something uh, cut and his scissors weren't doing that. So I, I pulled out my little, my Uncle Henry pocket knife and cut it for him. And, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'd go down to my grandfather's down in South Texas, and if I didn't have, if I wasn't outside, uh, uh, I was cutting sunflowers, I was cleaning ditches with a machete, uh, you name it. So I always had a blade in my hand, 
whether it was a knife or a machete or something. So did you always know that you wanted to make them? Or were you always a maker of stuff? Oh, yeah. I grew up. My dad was a woodworker uh, mechanic. Um, I got into mechanic when I was in high school and never, never imagined uh, really making a knife. Uh, but it was always one of those things like, I wonder, you know, if I could do this. I wonder if it's something that that I could do. The first knife I made, I should have grabbed that one because that's it's pretty crude looking. But uh, it, my dad made my brother and I these dressers, and for the drawers to slide in smoothly, there were pieces of metal in the bottom, and my brother and I stole those out and we made knives out of them. And uh, of course, the drawers didn't slide very smooth anymore. But I put an antler handle on it and uh, put the date on it, and the first knife I made, I was sixteen, and it just kind of molded into from there uh wanting to make more and more knives and of course i didn't actually make a knife until after that until probably uh seven or eight years ago and then about a year after that two years i took that uh abs class intro bladesmithing and that really kicked it off i was like all right this is what i'm going to do and i uh it was funny because my wife came out in the garage one night and I was working on a knife and she said, okay, look, you've got, she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm fixing, I'm working on this knife. And she said, look, you've got too many hobbies. You got hunting, fishing, woodworking, <laughs> making knives, doing mechanic and doing this, doing that. Uh, you got to pick, uh, you got to pick something. I said, all right, I'm going to make knives. She said, okay. And that she was the one that actually got me set up through the class for the ABS. Mm. So she really, bolstered me into making knives man you that you can't ask for a better blessing than that oh, you know absolutely because i would imagine it's not a, an easy road to hoe you know making making knives for a living so that that takes you know retraining your expectations that that takes learning how to run a small business uh, oh. all all of the same all of the things outside of the joy of making knives that you have to do to make it work that's right it uh she's been a big help. She has, she is the more business minded of the two of us. Uh, I'll bring an idea to her and she'll, she'll tweak it and she'll say, all right, we, we should do this or do that. Uh, or how about we do this? So she's, she's the one with the business mind. I'm the one that's like, just let me hammer and grind. <laughs> and so, uh, she really helps me out a lot. So you were in the Marine Corps um, when you first started. Well, I mean, you, you made your first one at 16, but that sounds like a shiv with a yeah. with an yeah, antler absolutely. handle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but your first legitimate knife, were you in the Marine Corps at the time? Yes, I uh, I was in the Marine Corps and it was it was kind of weird because so we don't we don't have cable or anything. We haven't had cable in a while. So didn't know about all these shows that were on TV. I knew about, uh, you know, like uh, Naked and Afraid and different things like that, but I didn't know anything about Force of Fire. And I was actually on the unit I was with. I was on duty one night, you know, it's a 24 hour post and sitting there. If anybody has any trouble or whatever, I go investigate what's going on, uh, write it down in the logbook and, uh, you know, it gets investigated. So there's a TV in the, in the duty hut. And I'm flipping through channels and I happen to land on the history channel and it talks about making knives. And I'm like, Oh, well, I've been doing that for a couple of years. Let's see, you know, let's see what this is about. And, uh, I was like, Oh, that's really cool. And then, you know, I'd only get to watch it whenever I was on duty or I'd watch a little bit, you know, on YouTube here and there. And, uh, yeah. So it was, uh, then whenever I went to the ABS class, you know, everybody was talking about it. And by that time mm -hmm. it was in its second season or into the first season. And yeah, just what, you know, started following all those guys on Instagram and Facebook and everything and that were uh, on the show and uh, really started getting into the rabbit holes and the wormholes of knife making. Didn't realize yeah. all that there was in knife making as I do now. Uh, I got. I got to say, I think that show has done a lot. Uh, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are people who who 
think the opposite, but I think it's done great things to normalize yep. knives, A and B. Um, you know, you'll have my wife and I watching that show and she'll be like, don't you know, in a time competition, you never use whiteout. Come on, man. Haven't you yeah. ever watched this show? You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we, it, it's really explained some of the finer points of this and, and shown people that, that a love of knives is, is, is a love for well-crafted things right. as well as, as well as very useful things. So you were on Forged in Fire season six, episode 24, the boar sword. That's this long yes. half spear, half sword with a flamberge at the top. Yeah. And so really how, interesting tool. How did you get involved in Forged in Fire? What was that whole process like? So that was, uh, it was an interesting process because at the time, uh, my wife, well, I had gotten orders to Massachusetts. And <laughs> at the time, I, I was like, there's Marines in Massachusetts? And why? <laughs> so we ended up going to Massachusetts. And the second year I was there, uh, was, you know, I had already met Matt and uh, Matt Chase. And we had gotten together a few times. And he really helped me. Uh, I had made my first bar of Damascus with him on his power hammer. And so I uh, had watched a couple of the shows. And then out of the blue, I got a, a cold call uh, or a message from one of the casting agents. And I was like, yeah, OK, yeah, this, all right. So I'll play your silly game. So he said, how about I call you tomorrow at, at lunchtime? I said, all right, that'll work. So he actually called me. So I talked to him. And he said, all right, how about tomorrow we set up a, a Skype interview? And, you know, have all this. And so he sent me paperwork. I'm like, this guy's really getting in the weeds, you know, just for a scam. <laughs> so uh, filled out some information. I left the information off, sent it all back to him. And we did Skype interview. And he said, OK, you know, uh, showed him some of my work. And uh, he said, all right, you know, I'm going to give this to the guys that, on the History Channel and they'll see what they do. Well, at the time, he didn't know what episode or anything like that. Uh, my wife had all kinds of questions. She was worried. And uh, the more and more I thought about it, I was like, you know what? I might, you know, this might not be something that would be good. And then the more and more I thought about it, I was like, you know what? My my company name is not live every day like your last for nothing. I was like, I'm going to go ahead and do this. So uh, the producer called me up, said, hey, you know, congratulations. You know, we, we picked you for this uh episode i was like all right cool uh that was in november of 2018 i believe or yeah 18 and uh december came along didn't get any call back or anything so january came around and i got a call back and they said all right this is what we're gonna do this is when you're gonna come down uh you're gonna you know this that here's the number and everything you're gonna stay at this hotel all right sounds good so I get all my stuff packed and I, the night before I was going to leave, I got a call saying, Hey, uh, sorry, but the show has been canceled indefinitely. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to reschedule. And I was like, okay, whatever. Well, what I didn't know at the time was they were casting me for the military episode that for the Marine Corps. And I had to get paperwork and everything sent back in. Well, that paperwork didn't, I didn't get it done in time for my unit to send in in order to get on that actual episode. Mm. So they called me back and said, Hey, good news, bad news. Uh, we want to keep you on a, for another episode, but you didn't make this one. I said, okay, fine. So February comes around. I get another call from the producer and it says, Hey, we're ready to go again. I said, all right, got all my stuff packed. He called me the night before and said, uh, Hey, bad news. One of the judges is indisposed. Uh, we're going to have to cancel the show or, uh, postpone the show again the episode i was like this is never going to happen uh, at that time i was like if it happens it happens if it doesn't no big deal so uh about a month to the to that day later i get another call and said hey we're ready to go are you and i said all right let's do it so went down there and still you know being being deployed and going to other countries uh you always hear stories of marines or people waking up in bathtubs full of ice the next morning with their. <laughs> so here I am thinking, you know, I'm going to get down there. I'm going to get in this hotel and I'm going to wake up in the morning with, in a bathtub full of ice. So, uh, it wasn't until we actually got to the, the, 
the building and whatnot. And we walk up and I see all these forges and anvils. And I was like, all right, it's go time. Let's <laughs> Good. I'm not so, being kidnapped. Yeah. But it was a, it was a fun experience. It was something that I've never done before. Never been in front of a camera like that. Uh, and being from a, a little bitty podunk town in South Texas, it was something that I never dreamed that I, I would have the chance to take part of. So it was great. So, okay, I've watched, you know, every episode, give or take. And uh, I, it always seems to me like that first opening um, time where you have to make a billet and, and start a blade in your signature style. To me, that seems like the most stressful part of, of it because you're new. And uh, so what was it like? What was that whole process like? So I, I had already, because I, I'd had since November of the year before to prepare my head. I watched uh, previous episodes, what guys were doing, what they weren't doing. Uh, what worked, what didn't work. And my wife and I, you know, at that time we we're, you know, we got uh, Hulu or something like that. And we were just watching uh, episode after episode after episode. And I was like, oh, that guy shouldn't have done that. And she was, <laughs> all right, you don't do that then. Uh, I started, uh, I started forging stuff that I'd never forged before. Uh, cookeries and uh, and had no idea that I'd have to forge a flamberge blade. So not even, didn't even think about doing that. But, uh, so just kind of mentally preparing myself and, uh, physically preparing myself in the sense of, uh, just hammering more. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was swinging a, a four pound sledgehammer, uh, before I went and I took a four pound sledgehammer with me and hammering that signature knife out uh especially out of a piece of steel you don't really know what it is or what you're going to get as far as steel the the variables are there's so many variables it's it's unreal so all four of us actually grabbed the same steel and it was a uh coil spring 5160 presumably and it was one inch round and trying to hammer a one inch piece of round 5160 with a coal forge was not easy. So uh, especially having to hand crank the the blower. So that was something different for me. So you were on one of the coal forge shows. That's right. Yeah. And those are far and few between. And um, they are, uh, it seems like it's would throw you off your game because a, you have to worry about keeping this coal forge going, but doesn't, doesn't color, play into oh, forging like it absolutely does um in a in a gas forge you can put the piece of steel in the gas forge and you can see it you can see the steel in the forge and you can see the flames hitting it in a coal forge you've got it buried just below a, a thin layer of coal so you can't really see the steel uh you've got to be able to read the you know the the physical portion of turning the crank uh be able to read the steel and everything. And when you pull it out, you hope that you haven't burned off the end of it. And I, my blade uh, ended up being within the parameters, but I was going to make a full tang and it ended up being because I didn't have enough material for the full tang. I ended up making a hidden tang. And that actually was the second hidden tang knife I ever made. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it was, uh, I was, the pucker factor was, a uh, at that time, a, it was about a nine and a half, <laughs> uh, but it, everything worked out, you know, and, uh, I took, and we had the heat treat in the coal forge as well. And we were outside in the sun. So what I did was I grabbed a piece of angle iron that was, I was laying around somewhere and I stuck it in the coal forge and made a little oven in there and that's what i heat treated my blade in and uh and quenched it and everything came out everything came out good and uh one of the crazy things is you know you do uh you do the physical portion of the show then you get called back into an interview room and they ask you questions about what you just did mm -hmm. but you have to answer them in a present tense form not a past tense 
So they asked me about that, about me quenching my blade. And uh, there's a meme of me out there saying, uh, I'm pleased because <laughs> I, and there's no expression on my face because I had already gone through answering that question five or six times and the producer wasn't happy with how I answered it. And so, uh, so by the time I finally got it right, I said, I'm pleased. My file <laughs> skates and, I, and I'm pleased. So, yeah, it was... Uh, my mom made me a shirt and everything that says I'm pleased across the front of it. And uh, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. Uh, it's funny. That's reality, huh? Reality yeah. TV. Yeah. That's, it was, uh, that was something else about it too. Uh, cameras everywhere, but you don't, I didn't notice them. Uh, it wasn't until I went back for the final part of the episode where I actually noticed, oh man, there are like 20 cameras in this room and they're all pointed at me. Uh, so that was interesting because there were times where, you know, I'm forging this blade out and I noticed there's a guy right down in front of me with the camera pointed up at the, from the bottom of the anvil up at me. And I'm the only thing I can think is, dude, you're about to lose a, a camera or a hand or get a, a, you know, if this blade comes out of the tongs, you're getting a hot piece of steel right on top of you. But other than that, I didn't, I couldn't hear what the judges were saying. I didn't even pay attention to the judges, cameras, nothing. I was in my own little world. And uh, I think that's, I think that's what helped me uh, just because I, I wasn't paying attention to anybody else. I was just focused on what I was doing and it worked. So is that one of those reasons why you're attracted to it in the first place? You can get in the zone you can yeah. flow with it. Yeah, it it's definitely one of those things. I could, I'll go out in the shop about seven seven thirty in the morning, eight o'clock, and uh, and I I don't want to come in. You know, it's dark outside, and I'll have already gotten five or six calls from my wife saying, you know, when you're going to come in, and I'm still out there, just hand <laughs> probably hand sanding is what I'm probably doing, <laughs> uh, but uh, finishing knives, uh, hammering them out. Uh, I like to hammer out knives when it's cool. Uh, this time of the year is, is pretty difficult to uh, yeah. hammer out knives. So I, I try to do do it in the cool of the evening. So uh, you finish your knife. You go to test it. What's that like? So I was, at that point, I was, you know, it had been, I was already mentally prepared. I knew what I was doing. Uh, everything had gone right up to that point. So I wanted them to destroy my knife. You know, I wanted to see what they could do to it to make it fail. And I was, I was giddy. I was, I was happy. I was like, all right, let's, let's do this. You know, chop it, hit the wheelbarrow. I want to see what it's going to do. I want to see if your test if what I did to the knife, if, if my knowledge is going to be able to pass your destructive test. And I was, uh, yeah, I was happy when it, when it went through all the tests, it was, that was, it wasn't so much nerve wracking as it was just, all right, tear it up. Uh, I wasn't worried. Do you do that kind of testing on your work on a regular basis? Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I, until I have a process down for each knife, uh, I still have some stock removal knives. Uh, so they are pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, they're, they're cut out of the pretty much the same steel. Uh, if it's a different steel, I'll still test it, uh, afterwards. But, uh, most of the steel that I use for my stock removals is, uh, 1075, 1095. And, I've got some CPM 154, but I haven't used it yet. So I'm interested to see. I'm about to start testing that. It's one of but, my uh, favorite steels. Love yeah, that. I I really like it too. Uh, a lot of the knives that I've had are CPM 154, and it takes a good edge. It holds a good edge, and uh, yeah, I like it. Matt actually got me into CPM 154. Oh, did it. he? Yeah. Okay, so uh, but I I, I want to talk uh, more about your process, but before we get there, I want to I want to wrap up Forged in Fire because this is the right. part this is the part of that experience that I think most of us um, 
really respect. You know, you've never made a sword before. A lot of people on the show, you know, you've never made these these kind of weapons before. And then you know it's going to be a doozy, you know, and it's going to be large. And um, so what was that like, uh, watching them lift the veil and see that you were going to be making that that knife, uh, that sword? And then what was the process like trying to figure that out? So me and the other guy are standing there, and I see this you know, weapon up on the top of the table and it's covered with the, the cloth. And I'm pretty good at being able to, <laughs> I'll be driving down the road and I'll see something on the side of the highway and I'm like, oh, that was that was a screwdriver. I, you know, and, and I'm doing 70 miles an hour. So here I am looking at this cloth and trying to figure out the shape of whatever it is that's underneath and couldn't figure it out when Will pulled that cloth off. The first thing that went through my mind was, I don't know how I'm going to make that. Uh, you know, it had two guards on it. It had a had a hand guard on it. Then it had a guard right above the the blade to keep the you know the bore yeah. from running up the shaft. And so it was it was like a a bore spear, but on a sword shaft. If yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it, it was just really odd. And so. Uh, I think what a lot of people that, because uh, I didn't know this at the time, all I saw was that, uh, you know, they pulled the cloth off and I was like, all right, let's go home and get this done. Uh, they actually pulled us back in the back and explained rules to us and how they wanted it and this and that. And I don't think a lot of people under really understand that, especially reading comments on the YouTube episode <laughs> after that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they, and they, I mean, from the producer to the judges, it was all, if you have any questions, ask now. Here's our information, our, our phone number, our contact info. If you have any questions while you're home, give us a call. So all that help was there in the sense of if we didn't understand something, we had the ability, ability to find out. And, of course, you know, I didn't know what Flamberge was at the time. You know, all I saw was this curvy blade. So uh, go home, you know, doing research, doing research about the boar sword, trying to find out, you know, what historical significance it had. Uh, it was. I love I love history. So being able to look up the history of different stuff like that and find it out and then also getting to make it. And uh, that was exciting. That was that's what I was really looking forward to. I was happy to be able to make it that to that point in the show to be able to be challenged uh, on something I've never done before. So that was, I like that part. So that So you ended up uh, turning in a beautiful, a beautiful sword. Doug Mark had a, laid a board to waste with it. Uh, I mean, it was a nasty, sharp, uh, it passed all the, all the sharpness tests, all the abuse tests. Um, when they're done with it, they take it, right? That's their their sword. Yeah. So, <laughs> Damn. Uh, I know. I was a little, of course, I, I was I was disappointed, but at the same time, basically, the way I look at it is they paid me, you know, the prize money for the sword. So yeah, yeah. Was wasn't uh, too upset, but uh, the uh, the other guy got his sword back. Uh, oh, okay. So the runner up gets his weapon back, and then the. From my understanding, as bad as this may be may sound to say, I've watched a few episodes since my episode, but not enough to really look at the the wall of fame. Yeah. And yeah, see yeah. whether or not it's up there. But that's what they told us. All the winning weapons would they would go up on the wall of fame. So I don't know if it has or not, but uh uh yeah, I got the prize money, so I wasn't too I wasn't too <laughs> upset. So how has that experience of being on that show, uh, has that turbocharged your, your forging career? Uh, I would say uh, yes and no. Uh, you get certain uh, – you get into certain groups, and uh, like going to Blade Show, uh, one of the things I was looking for at Blade Show this last year was just uh, getting to see some of the other guys that were on the show and whatnot that – uh, you see reruns of and whatnot, uh, like uh, Mace Fatale, uh, 
and some of those guys. So, and I've I've met Mace up in Maine at Hammerins and everything. So that was that was really cool. Uh, but uh, people will see, you know, on my business card, uh, you know, Force and Fire season, and and they'll ask about it. And I was, all I'll give them is, oh, I was a great experience. You have to watch the show. So, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, so most people that order knives, though, it's, uh, you know, they'll start talking to me and say, oh, have you ever seen that show, Forge of Fire? And I'm like, yeah, I've seen a few episodes. I I really don't like to go into a whole lot of detail and just let them kind of find out on their own, maybe. But uh, yeah. it's it's been good, uh, especially since retiring. Uh, business is really been has picked up and i'm always busy making knives so that's been good for sure so what are your knives Ta let's talk about the knives you make uh, most regularly what what do you really specialize in and what's your philosophy behind the knives so i like to specialize in uh like a utility knife or a a hunter uh something about the size of a hunter um uh, and the reason for that is, is it's just a, it's a good all around size blade for doing all sorts of stuff, uh, cutting rope, uh, <laughs> shaving fingernails, uh, cutting an apple, uh, you name it. It's just one of those things that, and it's, that is what until recently, that's what I thought because I was thinking selflessly, oh, that's what everybody has. Everybody wants a, uh, utility knife that they can use for you know, carry around with them. And so that's what I typically make, whether it's a stock removal or a forged blade. And I will do, you know, like the, the one that's there, I'll do uh Bowie knives. I love making Bowie knives, actually. Bowie knives, cookeries. I love making utilitarian knives that are just, I mean, they can do whatever they're, they're put to the test. Uh, and I've just recently started getting into making, uh, I've got a few kitchen knives that I'm working on now. Mm, yeah. Uh, I've made a kitchen knife. One of my first knives that I made when I was, you know, a baby and all this, uh, made it out of a farrier's rasp and, uh, it was a Christmas present to my sister-in-law, whether or not she still has it. I have no idea, <laughs> but, uh, discovered, you know, later on after getting, you know, more knowledge, a kitchen knife made out of a hor uh, a farrier's rasp is not <laughs> not what you want because food and everything sticks in the the uh, where the teeth used to be. So yeah. I don't know, but uh, so yeah, typically Bowie knives, hunting knives, uh, and now starting to get into uh, kitchen knives. So yeah, it's. Uh, and the purpose behind them, like I said, just because it's, you know, ca cavemen, you know, or that's that was the first tool. I, you know, I need to cut the. How am I going to gut this animal? And they used a sharpened rock or a sharpened utensil to do that. And everybody, everybody, no matter whether it's, you know, the farmer out in the field or the the wife in the kitchen or the woman in the kitchen that is cooking supper or the, the man in the kitchen knives are being used by everybody all around the world. Yeah. And so it's one of those things that everybody uses it and they don't think about it. You know, if we, if we were Edward scissors hands, we wouldn't have to worry about having knives. So that's why I make knives. I, I like being able to put knives in the tools in the hands of people so they can use. You mentioned before that you do a lot of fishing and hunting. And so it kind of makes sense to me that your favorite knife to make would be a hunter because it right. seems like the most useful straight across the board. Uh, what, when you say a hunter, what do you mean? Is that like a four inch blade drop point? Like Typically, yes, it's going to be a, a four inch blade, whether it's a, a hidden tang, a full tang, stock removal or a forged out blade. Uh, it's going to be something along mm. the lines of this where the handle and the blade are roughly, they're balanced. Uh, they're roughly about the same length as each other. Uh, and it's, you know, it comes to a, 
a nice point where it can be used for, you know, not stabbing, but you know, you need to be able to get that point in, especially mm. if you're you're gutting a hog or a deer or something. That hair on a hog or a deer is very coarse; it's hollow, and it will dull a knife very quickly. So you want something to be able to get in there to be able to puncture and just get under the skin. And then from there, uh, you can choke up on the blade and use it like a zipper when you're, uh, when you're gutting a deer or a hog or, or anything else. And it's not too big to where it can't be used on a squirrel. Uh, it can't be used on smaller game, you know, rabbits and whatnot, pheasant. Uh, you can, it, you could fillet a fish with it, but it'd be a little bit more difficult. But the right. job could get done if you if it needed to be done. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, it's something that can be used in a lot of different tasks. Uh, let's let's look let's talk about that knife in particular. Can you hold that back up? All right, yeah. uh, there's that the uh, Hamon line, I think it's called. Yeah. Uh, what is that, and uh, how did you arrive at that? So the Hamon, uh, and this is. This is something that I learned in the uh, intro to bladesmithing in the ABS class. And this was learned from Jim Kroll. And it's flame painted is what he calls it. And so what we do, and this is uh, 1075. And basically what he'll do is take a torch uh, with a cutting tip on it and just making sure you don't hit the oxygen lever and heat up the Ricasso right in this area because it's thicker steel go from there start heating up the, the back of the spine back of the tip and then come along the edge hit back here at the ricasso spend a little time here and then come back heating up to the edge and then make a little dot a little dot a little dot and then heat it up and then quench it and this is making sure you do it on both sides so you have optimal or uh even temperature on both sides because if not if you have it heated on and i've done this you heat it on one side only and you quench it, what's going to happen is it's going to pull to that side mm -hmm. and the blade's going to work. So as you can see, the, the hamon is darker than the spine, than the top of the blade. And the reason for that is because this is the hardened steel and this is the soft steel. So I could take a file right now and I could, I could cut into the spine of this knife because it's soft. Mm -hmm. The cutting edge, the file would skate skate across it so that's how this hamon was was achieved on this blade uh, and it's it's a very simple process it does take a little bit of uh practice though for sure i thought that it was two different steels and uh, uh and so that's interesting so so you're doing this hamon was made for a differential heat treat basically exactly so, and exactly. and what what's the benefit of having a hard cutting edge like that, but a soft uh, so spine? The, the good thing about this is it makes it a very uh, it makes it a tough knife. And the reason why is if you think about, uh, well, let's say for example, like uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, you've got cables that come up, and they're not rigid. They they give a lot of flex. If you in fact, if you stand on any bridge over to the top of a highway, you can feel that bridge whenever a semi-truck goes underneath it. If there's no other traffic on the bridge you're standing on, you can feel that, that bridge sway. And so that's kind of the same engineering in having a soft spine, but a hardened edge. So if I needed to, this blade has a lot more flex in it than if it was completely hardened. Now, granted, you know, when you completely harden a blade, you're tempering it back. And you would temper this back as well, just so that cutting edge is not glass hard right. uh so it's tempered back as well but you still have that soft spine so you have a little bit more flex you get into the the pelvis cavity of a deer and trying to cut through that cavity or that uh, pelvic uh split or trying to split a breastplate on a deer or a hog uh you want something that that'll get the job done and a a knife like this you know if you twist it just wrong or whatnot it's going to have a little bit more give in it and it's going to be more forgiving. Um, so that's one of the reasons for uh, not a hormone, but a differentially heat treated blade. Yeah. Uh, so and, one, what's oh, go ahead. no, 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 please. 
Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, uh, so this blade is also differentially heat treated, uh, just slightly on the bottom. This was my test knife for uh, Journeyman Smith. And I'm not a Journeyman Smith yet. I have to turn in my, my five test knives, during knives. But this one uh, was differentially heat treated. And so it's got a hard cutting edge, but a soft spine. And when you're chopping through two by fours and slicing through rope and everything, uh, you want a blade that's going to flex so it doesn't snap in half. Man, and that's so, cool. So, so that yeah. was that was bent in that British sword test thing where they yeah. <laughs> crank it down. That is cool. So we, yeah, once you uh, once you chop through the two by fours uh, twice, uh, slice a rope. And then it still has to be able to shave hair. Then you take it and on the back side here, three inches from the tip up, you stick it in a vise, put a pipe handle on it, and bend it over 90 degrees till the master smith that's judging you, he says stop, and it'll be at 90 degrees. And it can't have a crack uh, more than two-thirds of the width of the blade. And it can't snap in half either. So this one passed. That's so So uh, tell me about the ABS, the, the smithing program, and, and what you're going through. So and it's what I like about the ABS is it's, it's based on performance. Uh, and the reason why I like that is the Marine Corps is based on performance. Uh, you didn't just get promoted because you uh, somebody liked you. Uh, you got, prom you got promoted on your merits and what you, what you did. So the ABS is like that in the sense that you have to, you're apprentice first and you have a, a time period, uh, two years. Uh, once you join the ABS, you have to be a member for two years and then you can test for journeyman Smith. If you have gone through the intro to bladesmithing class, that time gets cut in half. And after you've completed the class, you have a year and you can test for the ABS. And you have the performance test uh, where you make a, a blade that is 10 inches long, 5-inch handle, and so a total of 15 inches. And the blade has to be, uh, don't quote me on this, but it can't be more than 2 inches wide. Uh, thin, uh, I can't remember how the minimum thinness uh, or width, but... You have to do the performance test. And then after that, you have two years to be able to complete your five jury knives. And they test uh, a panel of master smiths get together and they test those. They look at those knives. They don't test them. They, they look at them. They look for fit finish. Uh, they look to make sure it's a well-made knife. If all of them agree, you know, they will ding you on things here and there. But if they all agree that you know what you're doing as a journeyman smith uh, or as an apprentice making those knives to test for your journeyman smith, you'll get a, a JS stamp, journeyman smith stamp. And now you're held to a higher quality, higher standard mm -hmm. in the ABS. And then from that time, uh, you can test for master smith. And I uh, haven't really... Uh, studied that portion of the ABS just because I'm not at that point. But uh, all your master smith knives, or you have to do the same test, performance test, but it has to be made out of Damascus. And mm. it has to be at least, I want to say, 300 uh, layers of Damascus. And uh, then you also have to make a, forgive me if I say this wrong, but a queen dagger. Uh so, and that has to be made out of Damascus. And that to me is, especially these days, it's very intimidating. Uh, and the reason why I say that is the, the skill level of the Smiths that are coming up through the ABS and some of the guys that are not even in the ABS, uh, their skill level is unbelievable. It's, I look at some of these guys' knives that they turn in, uh, like Jordan Lamont, uh, out of New York. Uh, he just tested for his master Smith this last year and, and got it with flying colors. Uh, beautiful knives, beautiful Damascus. 
and stuff like that, there's a lot of thought process that goes into making that Damascus. Uh, it's not just throwing a uh, steel together and forge welding it together and then, you know, hoping it comes out right. There's, yeah. there's a lot of thought that goes into it. So the ABS, I really like the ABS because it's a uh, performance driven. Uh, there's a ton. There's over thousands of years of knowledge just within the master smiths that are in the ABS. Uh, Jim uh, has been a, he's been a master smith or in the ABS for 40 years. And so working with him, it's been, he's, he's forgotten more stuff than I've learned with him. And so it's very interesting, very intimidating. Uh, how would you value, how would you put a value on that kind of mentorship? Uh, it seems cool. like mentorship is so important in creative fields. I, let's say uh, money wise, I don't have enough money to be able to put a, a price on it. Uh, it's one of those things that I, I thank Jim from the bottom of my heart uh, for everything that he showed me, even just the stuff that I don't think about. Uh, and he says, oh, no, what are you doing? Don't do it like that. Do it like this. And it's for one of the things that I've really learned from Jim and that in my own head I've had trouble with is process, the process of a knife from start to finish. Uh, and within that process, efficiency. And the efficiency, I think, is what gets a lot of uh, new makers and they get frustrated possibly uh, because they'll end up doing – I, I was doing it just within three, four months ago before I started working with Jim. I would have to do uh, the same step two or three times because I was doing it out of order. And working with Jim has been, it's streamlined my process and my efficiency. And so uh, it's been, I, I don't, I, it's priceless uh, being able to work with a master smith that has been doing it for that long uh yeah it's it's i'm very blessed <laughs> that that whole um uh sort of topic or concept of timing and uh order you know of making something um you know uh and then when you you know that is one thing to get down you know when you're making one knife you go a then b then c then d then e but when you're working on a whole bunch of different knives or different projects <laughs> at different stages of development and different stages of completion, then it's a, a juggling act that you, you really got to stay on top of, I would imagine. It is. And that's one thing I don't do. I don't do, uh, I, I don't really want to get into production in the sense of making 20, 30, 40 knives at one time. Mm. Would it be easier? Oh, absolutely. It absolutely would be easier. What I like doing is I like, and you know, this is, it's a curse and a blessing in a sense. Uh, and my wife will tell you the same thing because I like catering to the customer in the sense of I've got a kitchen knife that I'm working on that, uh, or will be working on. The guy wants a, a green handle because his wife likes the color green. And I asked him all these questions because he's ordering the knife for his wife. And I said, okay, what kind of handle do you want it? Most people that order a knife have no idea what they want in a knife. They just, they want a good looking knife and they want a knife that's going to cut and function. And so what I like to do is I like to make that knife special or one of a kind for that individual, for that customer, because then th that's something that they're going to show off. That's something that they're going to be able to pass down to their kid, their grandkids, uh, something that they can be proud of, something that they can say, oh, look what I got. Look, you know, and it's going to be a part of them because, hey, what color handle do you want? What's your favorite color? Oh, I like green. Uh, you know, what kind of uh, steel do you want? Oh, I, I have no idea. Well, what are you going to be using this knife for? Oh, I'm going to it's I'm going to use it every day. Okay. Do you, are you going to sharpen it? Or are you going to have somebody sharpen it? Those are the questions that I ask customers whenever they say they want a knife because I don't want them to be frustrated with a, a tool that, they're, that they can't sharpen or a tool that they have to sharpen 
every five days. So that's, I want to create something for an individual that is not going to work against them, but work for them. And they're going to be proud of, and they're going to be, they're going to use. Uh, I don't, I don't ever, I know probably at some point in time, but I hope to never see one of my knives on a, in a display case <laughs> up on somebody's mantle or something like that. I want to see it on their hip or I want to see uh, tomato juice patina or lemon juice or onion patina on a knife in the kitchen. That's what I want to see. That is what I really get my kicks off of is being able to see my what I've created being used. And to see history, like the history of the use through patina and that kind of oh, thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, you were talking about making a knife specifically for the person who orders it. And this, the corniest thing came to my mind, but you're, you're making you knives as, as you're making knives as unique as the owner that's going to take it because it has right. all of their little peccadillos built into it. Right. And, and oh, just you saying that just gives me goosebumps because that's what <laughs> I, that's what I strive for. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. I, I have a pretty big collection, uh, mostly production knives and, and I've been, uh, I've been slowly but surely moving more and more uh, handmade custom yeah. um, and because there's a I don't know you feel you feel something from it you know I have a bunch of old swords and knives on the wall yeah. behind me and they all uh, they all have some history to them right and and, uh, and something about the uniqueness of a knife um, yeah it's that's really starting to become important to me yeah it's a uh... And I've got, well, like, for example, and probably not to, I don't want to bring this up too early, but, uh, uh, for example, this, yes. uh, this is, this was the first tomahawk that I forged out and it was, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side was a farmer down in South Texas, uh, cotton, corn, you, you name it. And every tractor he had had a ball peen hammer on it and i know as soon as i said that a lot of guys are going to be like what ball peen hammer oh that's that's ridiculous but i'll never this this will never be for sale uh just because it was made out of one of my grandfather's ball peen hammer oh, that's so cool and uh it, it goes with it's if it's not in my truck it's in my my go bag and it goes with me it's within running distance to everywhere I go. So, uh, and it's, it's one of those things that, like I said, it was the first, first one I hammered out Tomahawk. Uh, and the bad thing about it is I didn't have a Tomahawk drift at the time. So I had, to I had to make my own handle for it. And so it will not take a standard Tomahawk handle. Huh. So that's another reason as well. So, uh, tell me about your Tomahawks, uh, uh, I was, um, I see you make one with a hammer pull and then you make one with a, um, a sort of a geometric chisel sort yeah. of spike. Is, is so, that's the same like one, right? This one right here. Yeah. That's so, cool. uh, and so that's kind of a little bit, I, I wouldn't say I, I stole it, but I mean, that's a, that's one of the other things about knife making is, uh, everybody gleans a little bit from everybody else uh from knowledge to what they do on a knife something they like on a knife uh and they'll do that on their own but tweak it a little bit maybe mm -hmm. so that chisel or that that chisel spike and whatnot is something that i got from butch Sheely at a hammer in um uh, in north carolina i want to say in 2017 2016 maybe and he made a little skull crusher, a uh, little little bitty tomahawk that you could fit up the sleeve of your shirt. Oh, cool. And I was like, oh, I was so intrigued. And, and from that point on, I was like, oh, that, I, I want to make a little bitty skull crusher like that. And that's where the chisel, the, the chisel point on the end came from. Uh, you know, I, I took his idea, kind of tweaked it a little bit for myself. But this is the peen the yeah. round part of the tomahawk i mean of the ball peen hammer that i hammered out and then ground down into this and this end 
was the hammer face of the ball peen hammer that I hammered out into uh, the cheek and the face of the, the tomahawk. So you have a swedge on the top of that tomahawk. Is it yes. sharp? Is that sharp up there? Or what's that for? Is that? Uh, it is not. And I've, okay. I've learned not to make it sharp <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, because it, uh, whenever I go to reach for it in my truck or out of my bag, typically I have to put it in my bag, handle down. So when I grab it out, I'll grab it by the top like this. Right. And, uh, it's bit me a couple of times. So I had to knock the edge off of it. <laughs> that's funny, man. Yeah. I saw that. I was like, Ooh, that's, I, you know, the more sharpened edges, the more you yeah, know, right. excited I get, but yeah, that makes sense. You're, you're using it for a lot, a lot more than, than, yeah. uh, uh, one of the other things too, uh, another Tomahawk I've got a, I want to say it's a cold steel Tomahawk that I've got. And I thought it would be a good idea. You know, like you said, the more sharp edges, mm -hmm. I thought it would be a good idea to sharpen, the bottom of the, the cheek of the tomahawk. And that turned out to bite me a couple of times as well. And so uh, I ground on my other tomahawk. I ground that one flat too <laughs> after a while. Well, you know, it's great if you're getting in tomahawk fights all the time, but if you're yeah, using right, your tomahawk exactly. for just, you know, whatever. So, right. so did you start making uh, the tomahawks for um, fellow Marines? Is that, uh, is that something that comes up in combat? Uh, Yes and no. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things, and it, it's funny. It's, it's kind of funny you say that because it's it's almost, uh, <laughs> you know, we think of fantasy knives, fantasy guns, fantasy, and we look at, you know, back in the day, I remember looking through Kit Ray uh, magazines and different stuff like that, and uh, uh, some of those other things that just had, crazy blades and they had spikes on the hand you know d guard with the spikes on it and everything uh some of the stuff that gil hibben makes yes uh <laughs> it's just like oh wow that's cool i'll never use it but that looks cool uh it's almost kind of the same as some of the stuff that you know we you know i've, I've made some stuff that in my mind oh this is going to be cool this is going to be awesome but i never use it yeah. uh and I try to, I try to stay away from stuff like that. But at the same time, it's it's you can't get away from it. Uh, there's there's stuff that uh, let's see where's that. Uh, I've got knives scattered all over the place. This, oh, uh, yeah, I've again. used it. I've I've beat it up. It's actually made out of a a model A leaf spring. And uh, I got it from a buddy of mine in North Carolina, and he was like, here, you could probably use this. So I hammered this blade out of it. Wow. I don't carry it with me or anything. And it doesn't even, it's it's destroyed, it's destroyed my my knife sheet, my pouches and whatnot, because it's so long uh, and it's so acute on the tip and everything. But this is, it's been indestructible. And at this point, it's more to me a fantasy knife uh than it is really a user it could be used but i look at it now as like that's nostalgic that's something that because i hammered this out for as practice for the show and not not so much for uh practice but just to see what i could destroy with this knife mm -hmm. so i froze buckets of water and just i chopped buckets of, of ice and i chopped through uh oak logs and i've chopped through everything with this cinder blocks and all kinds of stuff just trying to destroy it and it's it's held up and uh so yeah it's i don't know it, it's kind of one of those weird things you know people want a uh, a buoy knife and i i don't discredit anybody that wants a buoy knife because i love making them yeah. uh but it's one of those things is like when when's that ever going to be used but <laughs> it's it's one yeah. of the, it, it's 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 a very fine line for me it's like yeah i'll make that yeah absolutely <laughs> even though you're not going to use it i'll make it <laughs> yeah but uh it, i mean and i don't care what you know i would rather like i said i would if somebody wanted a bowie knife 
Mm-hmm. And, and you, know, not, you know, a nice Bowie knife, even if it was made out of Damascus and the amount of time that goes into making Damascus and making it the fit and finish and everything, I would still love to be able to see them send me a video or a picture of them just using mm-hmm. that knife to destroy something. Yeah. Uh, just cutting through a fence post or I don't care. I would, I would rather see it be used. I don't know. That's just me. That's the way I, I was. That's the way I grew up. My grand, like I said, my grandfather was a farmer. Nothing was wasted. Yeah. Uh, yeah nothing was that. just bought just to be bought. Um, and so it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, there's that very fine line, but I was still, I don't know. It's interesting. So- what is the uh, what's the knife that you still haven't made that you really want to make at some point? Uh, every time I laugh, the computer moves. But uh, it's <laughs> it's funny you ask that because I know anybody that watches this that knows me is going to say he needs to make his make his five journeyman smith knives. <laughs> uh, those are a little bit intimidating. Uh, the reason why is because I've seen the judges judge and they and they judge fairly uh that's one thing i like about it but some of the stuff that has been turned in i'm 40 years old i turn 41 next month or uh october and this last spring i went down to texarkana to a hammer in and uh i'm gonna get her first name wrong but i want to say it's karis Fisher. Uh, Her dad was also testing. He was a journeyman smith. She was an apprentice. She tested for her journeyman smith, and she is, at the time, she was 17 years old. Wow. Uh, (laughs) So, and they were, they were very good looking knives. uh, Very nice looking knives. And to me, that was, that was intimidating, seeing a, a 17 year old turn in knives and get her journeyman smith and get best journeyman smith knife uh so to see her do that and to have to do it myself those are the those are the knives that i'm most looking forward to doing but at the same time uh are intimidated by so but i think once i get past those journeyman smith knives I think I'm, I'll have more confidence in doing my Master Smith knives. And uh, granted, they'll be just a, a lot tougher. But uh, yeah, so it, those are those are the knives that intimidate me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see why I, I had a chance to look uh, for the, you know, that Quillian dagger you're talking about for the yeah. Master Smith. I was looking at uh, one at Blade Show and it had um, it had written next to it all the different things you have to pay attention to, and uh, yeah, so that yeah. I mean that that looks insane. So, how do people get in touch with you, Jonathan? How do people find out more about your knives and put in orders with you and and the like? So, I am on Instagram uh, at Ledlow Knives, uh, and Ledlow stands for Live Every Day Like Your Last, and I can't take credit for that. Uh, that came from a buddy of mine, a Marine, that uh, 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 six years ago, uh, this last February, uh, he passed away, and that was his motto. And I, I looked up to him, uh, and his motto was live every day like your last. And I, right about the same time, I was really getting heavy into making knives and was trying to figure out, you know, every, you see all these four black stump forge and this and that and i was like i gotta have a name for my knives and uh he had just passed away and so i was i asked his wife i said would you mind if i called my my business you know lead little live every day like your last in his honor and and uh she said absolutely and so i can be reached on on facebook or instagram i also have a website uh and I can be messaged through the website, and it'll, I'll get an email. And uh, so those are the three main communications and uh, platforms that I have for my knife business. 
Great. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was great to talk with you. I had such a good time hanging out with you and Matt at sure. Blade Show down in the pit and stuff and just and just shooting it. I knew I'd enjoy talking to you. So thanks again for coming on the show, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. Take care. Thank you. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, Jonathan Caruso of Lead Little Knives. Um, I, I, I see a tomahawk in my future and maybe a kitchen knife for my wife. Uh, you know, th that's just how it happens. Uh, so if you want to watch other uh, interviews with great people from the knife world making this whole thing happen, check us out every Sunday. Uh, we drop uh, an interview show. Wednesday, of course, is the midweek supplemental where I show you new knives that have come through the collection. And then uh, Thursday our live stream, which I always look forward to. Check us out there and uh, and join us, join the conversation, and you can actually join us on screen if you go to thenifejunkie.com slash join. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.